And we are rolling. In chapter 24 of Superbugs, what did you mean by anthrax? Anthrax is something that doctors haven't been thinking about until recently. Uh, it is a toxin produced by a bacterium called Bacillus anthracis. And anthrax is something that typically lives on animals. It's a bacterium that um, only occasionally gets to humans, but recently it's been weaponized. And that rogue scientists can figure out a way to purify the toxin from this bacterium. And that's what we saw um, not too long ago, actually, when it was being mailed to politicians, the toxin, and freaking people out. Um, it thought to be something that had gone away, but we've found something really unusual and something I decided to continue to write about in Superbugs, which is that Bacillus anthracis lives on reindeer. And sometimes when those reindeer die, they end up below a level of permafrost. And in Russia, a few years ago, that permafrost started melting. And as it melted, those reindeer carcasses went up to the surface. And the anthrax that was on them, that had been frozen for generations, suddenly emerged and became alive. And was something that we had to fear and actually evacuate people from Russia for fear that the changing of the climate may expose them to this toxin. And it was something when I started writing Superbugs, I never dreamed that I would be including but now uh, has become a public health issue. Where do we use antibiotics aside from a doctor giving it to a sick patient? Well, the interesting thing about antibiotics is that you can use them pretty much anywhere you want, uh, and that becomes the problem. One of the reasons that we have superbugs is that we have been misusing antibiotics. You know, there's commonly the idea of the doctor giving the patient antibiotics, whether or not that is appropriate or inappropriate. But we should also remember that dentists prescribe antibiotics. Uh, think about your toothache and when it won't go away. Uh, there is a new study that says up to 80% of antibiotics prescribed by dentists may actually be inappropriate. That's just from healthcare providers. Then think about how we use antibiotics in commercial agriculture. Uh, I come from Florida, in the Florida orange groves. We pump full of antibiotics to protect the crops. This is a good thing on the one hand that we protect the crops, but the downside is that the soil where those orange groves are growing are teeming with superbugs because the bacteria that live there have been exposed to antibiotics and they're figuring out ways to mutate and evolve to evade these antibiotics. Another example is in um, farming, meat producing animals. You know, we pump pigs and chicken and livestock full of antibiotics not to keep them healthy but because it makes the meat on their bones bigger. And we've been trying to cut back on that because when you go to the meat aisle, many of the uh, slabs of meat that are in the frozen section uh, actually contain drug-resistant bacteria because the animals got exposed to antibiotics. Uh, I could go on and on. Another place is um, when animals are rescued. Pets uh, are pumped full of antibiotics before they're given new owners in, a, in an attempt to heal them. And there was an outbreak of a superbug a couple of years ago where uh, these pets were given to new owners and they licked their owners faces and the bacteria in their mouths were transferred to the owners and they were full of drug resistant superbugs. So one of the things that we can do to curb the promotion of these dangerous pathogens is to make sure we use antibiotics appropriately and that turns out to be a rather difficult thing to do. Are humans responsible for the spread of antibiotic resistant bacteria? Well we're playing a role in creating them by misusing antibiotics. And then the question is, how do they get from one person to another? Every bacterium uh, or fungus or parasite or virus has a different level of pathogenicity, and it also has a different level of distribution where it can go from one person to another. So some things pass very easily from one person to another. A classic example is C. diff. Perhaps the most contagious thing would be measles. If I had measles and I sneezed in a crowded room, I could expose hundreds of people. Then there are bacteria like MRSA, which may be living on my skin right now, that doesn't spread all that quickly. In fact, I could rub up against somebody and I wouldn't necessarily spread the, the bacterium to them. So what we spend a lot of time doing is coming up with um, 
infection prevention and control mechanisms so that we identify what are the dangerous pathogens and then what precautions do people need to take. And it turns out that's pathogen specific. There's not a one size fits all approach. The way to protect yourself from MRSA is different than the way to protect yourself from tuberculosis. And that's different than the way to protect yourself from Clostridium difficile, which is different than the way to protect yourself from anthrax. So a lot of time and energy is spent saying, how do we protect people without freaking them out? Are we running out of antibiotics that work? Why can't we just make new ones? Turns out making a new antibiotic is rather tricky. Uh, many people are familiar with the first commercially available antibiotic, something called penicillin, that Alexander Fleming discovered in the late 1920s. Became widely commercially available in the 1940s. Uh, and that ushered in what we call the golden era of antibiotic development, the 1950s, where it seemed like every few months a new antibiotic hit the market. Uh, but then something interesting happened, and that isn't a story that isn't often told, which is what happened after that golden decade of the 1950s. And unfortunately, what happened is that we turned our attention to other conditions, things like heart disease and cancer. And the pharmaceutical industry started making far more lucrative drugs to treat those conditions. And it wasn't until the 1990s that we appreciated the full scope of this problem, and we've been playing catch-up ever since trying to make new antibiotics. The reason it's so hard to make a new one is that the profit margins are very slim. It often takes a billion dollars and 10 years of testing to develop a new antibiotic. And the problem is, when that drug hits the market, it often isn't a big bestseller. So compare an antibiotic to something like a blood pressure medication. That blood pressure medication is something that a guy like me, a doctor, would go to you as the patient and say, take this pill every day for the rest of your life. Now that's a great marketing strategy. Now compare that to an antibiotic, where a doctor like me is very stingy about doling it out. I only give it in short courses. And even that wonderful antibiotic is eventually going to encounter drug-resistant bacteria, which would render it useless. So the pharmaceutical companies are now saying, wait a second. Why do we want to invest a billion dollars in a drug that may not be prescribed very often? And so that has caused this downturn in research and development of new antibiotics. We have a number of them in the pipeline. But the question is, are they antibiotics to treat the conditions we need? So the short answer to this question is, we have lots of new antibiotics coming, but we don't know if they're for the right conditions. Uh, that's going to be the future of drug development, is saying, how do we figure out what's the next antibiotic we need? And you have to forecast, sometimes a decade in advance, and that's what we spend a lot of time trying to figure out. What's causing the spread of antibiotic-resistant superbugs? Well, there's problems large and small that cause the spread. Uh, on the small scale, it's things like doctors and dentists um, prescribing antibiotics when they shouldn't. Sometimes that's hard. If a patient comes to your office with a fever and asks for an antibiotic and you say no, and then they come back again two days later and ask for an antibiotic and you say no because you think it's a virus and the antibiotic won't work, and then the patient comes back a third time, many doctors may eventually relent and say, okay, fine, here's a Z pack. Um, that inappropriate prescription may cause the bacteria to mutate, where there is a trillion bacteria living in your body at any one time. And when you take an antibiotic, it's going to kill a certain percentage of those bacteria, but some of them are going to survive. And they're going to survive either because they're inherently resistant to the antibiotic, or they develop molecular machinery to evade those antibiotics. And if those spread, it can cause problems, all because of an inappropriate antibiotic prescription. So that's on the small scale. And then there's the large scale, which is using antibiotics in commercial agriculture and farming. A classic example is the tulip gardens in the Netherlands and in Colombia, where we pump fungicides into these gardens to protect these beautiful flowers. But if you study the soil beneath the flowers, they are teeming with drug-resistant fungi and bacteria because they've now been exposed to antibiotics and to antifungal drugs, and they figure out how to evade these new predators. Why are we having an antibiotic-resistant bacteria problem? Haven't we been using antibiotics for the last 50 years with no major problem? The fundamental problem is that all of life evolves and mutates. And 
whenever you come up with a new way to destroy pathogens, some of those pathogens will die, but many will survive. And those that do survive are now drug resistant. So if we come up with a treatment for influenza, it may wipe out 99% of the influenza viruses circulating in the world. But that 1% that survives is going to be resistant because it is mutated. And so that's called selective pressure. Every time we come up with a new antibiotic or a new treatment, we're pressuring the pathogens to mutate and to become more virulent. And this is what keeps infectious disease specialists up at night, is saying, okay, we've got a new drug to treat a condition, but we're going to need another drug soon uh, as these pathogens continue to evolve. And what we're trying to figure out using artificial intelligence is how are they going to evolve so that we can stay one step ahead of them. You say superbugs are everywhere, but does that really matter if they are there in small quantities? And what's the real risk? This is a wonderful question. Uh, the most common question I get after someone reads my book is, so should I be afraid of this thing? The answer is complicated, but the short answer is that if you have a normally functioning immune system, you don't need to worry about superbugs. In fact, in this room, there could be dozens of different drug-resistant pathogens known as superbugs. But there's no fear because I've got multiple ways of protecting myself. The first being my skin. There could be superbugs in the corner of this room. And if they were to fall off of the ceiling and onto my arm, I'm OK because I have the skin protecting me. Uh, if the superbugs were to get under my skin, uh, I've got an immune system that will start attacking it. And if it were to travel from my blood to my heart, I have an additional layer of immune system. And so there's a series of, of protections we have. But the people who run into trouble are those who have some sort of immune impairment or they have a break in one of their protections. So if you have a big cut on your arm and you go swimming in a pool that has a dirty water, that allows a large influx of superbugs to get into your system. You still may have an immune system that wipes it out. But let's say that you're taking chemotherapy. You're somebody with cancer, and you've just taken chemo that wipes out the cancer, but also wipes out your immune system. You're at high risk. I went through this recently with a family member who was on chemo. And I was very careful. I didn't shake his hand. I, gave, I didn't give him hugs, because I didn't want to tra transfer anything from myself to him. And so what I tell people is the first step, if you want to educate yourself on your own risk, is to talk to your doctor and say, how's my immune system? Uh, many of the patients I see with superbug infections either don't know that they have a medical condition that weakens their immune system, or they don't know that they're on a medication that can weaken their immune system. Many people take prednisone for arthritis. Well, at high doses, that can really wreak havoc on your immune system and predispose you to drug-resistant pathogens in your environment. So begin with a simple conversation with your doctor. And if your doctor can't answer that question, you might want to find a new doctor. How does superbugs get the upper hand and become dangerous to our health compared to just existing in small quantities and not affecting us? When a superbug invades a human, there is this push and pull uh, where the immune system immediately attacks the superbug. And that begins with white blood cells that go and circulate. And uh, when they see something that's foreign inside the body, they go and try to surround it. One of the reasons that HIV is so dangerous is that it specifically targets and destroys white blood cells. So the very immune system that we rely on to protect ourselves is what it goes after. And most superbugs in the past, if they um, had become resistant to antibiotics, they had lost something vital in the process. In that mutation to become resistant to antibiotics, they became a bit weaker. And that allowed us to retain the upper hand. The challenge we're seeing is that the newest superbugs are becoming resistant to antibiotics, and they're becoming stronger. And that's scary. Uh, because we have to figure out a way to treat them. And with the limited resources we have of the various antibiotics that we have, um, there's only so much we can do once an uh, a superbug has taken hold in somebody's body. So one of the other ways that we can stay one step ahead of them is to improve diagnostics. So a big limitation in the treatment of superbugs is that we are often waiting until they're already inside the system, inside the human body. We want to be able to know where they are, 
before they get to us, and we want to be able to detect them very quickly and figure out, you know, if only two antibiotics in the world can work with a, against a various superbug, which two are they? And so coming up with very rapid molecular diagnostics is the next step to figuring out how do we stay one step ahead of them. And this is going to be an enduring battle. Superbugs are not going away. You know, we're only going to be seeing more of them. And we need to put our resources into both treatments and diagnostics. What is MRSA? And is it growing as a threat or is it the same as it was, say, 10 years ago? MRSA is perhaps the most famous superbug. It stands for Methicillin-Resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So that's a fancy way of saying a drug-resistant staph infection. Staph is everywhere. Uh, there may be staph on my arms and on your nose. And in fact, a recent study showed that if you were to stick a swab into the nose of healthcare workers, uh, at least 5% of them would have MRSA in their nose. That doesn't mean that they're sick. Uh, in fact, the immune system can often keep any drug-resistant bacteria, but especially MRSA, at bay. Um, but what happens is that in a certain subset of people, MRSA can get into the system and can really wreak havoc. It's especially dangerous once it gets into the blood because it likes to then travel to various organs. It loves to latch onto the heart, to the brain. If you have a knee replacement, it will find that metal in your knee and it will glom onto that. Um, and what we have found is that MRSA used to only be in certain places, like gymnasiums and nursing homes, uh, but then it has leached out into the community. And uh, for a while we made the uh, term community-associated MRSA. Um, but now we don't even make that discrepancy because it doesn't really matter. MRSA is everywhere, and we don't really treat it differently based on where it comes from. Um, it's sometimes helpful when we're trying to track back and see where did someone get a MRSA infection, but the truth is it doesn't really matter because it is now ubiquitous. Uh, it's not just in nursing homes. It's not just in gymnasiums, and we have to be on high alert. And in fact, when a patient comes into the emergency room now with a fever and we don't know what that fever is from, we often empirically treat them for MRSA, meaning we give an antibiotic that would treat MRSA even if we haven't confirmed the patient has it because it is so common. How long do antibiotic-resistant bacteria live? Depends on what the pathogen is. Antibiotic-resistant bacteria can, uh, some of them can live uh, on metal and wood surfaces for at least a week. Some can't do that at all. And what we spend a lot of time doing um, is figuring out what are the different places where these things can hide? Uh, a classic example of where a superbug can hide is in a, a, a basement, a damp, moldy basement. The classic thing that we, we worry about when a patient has a weakened immune system is uh, that they are going to be exposed to mold if they go and clean their, bath, their basement or their bathroom. And so what we are trying to figure out is what are the environments that allow superbugs to prosper so that we can tell people to stay away from those things. How close are we to actually running out of antibiotics that are effective? Well, it depends who you ask. If you ask me, I would say that we have plenty of antibiotics for the most common conditions, but we are running perilously low on antibiotics for some of the emerging uh, superbugs. And the challenge we have is that it takes a while to prove that a new drug is safe. If a new superbug appeared today out of thin air, we would immediately start testing in a test tube to see what drugs we have to treat that thing. Uh, but then we need to test that drug. If we find a drug that works, we need to test it in animals and then in humans. And that process is very time consuming because just because a drug cures a superbug in a test tube doesn't mean that it's going to do so in a human. And we have to make sure that we protect people before we expose them to a new drug. So I'm not really worried about running out of antibiotics. What I'm more concerned about is coming up with a nimble approach when a new superbug emerges to come up with a new drug to treat people. And we're using artificial intelligence right now to hunt for new drugs. And what we're trying to do is streamline the process so that when we find a promising new molecule that may be a new antibiotic, to figure out a way to safely bring that quickly to the patients who need it most. What are the predictions for deaths from superbugs in the future? Well, the term superbug is controversial. It's typically referred to drug-resistant bacteria, but we now know that uh, the term is actually a much more broad category that includes drug-resistant parasites and fungi and viruses. 
And if you put all of those drug-resistant pathogens into the bucket of superbugs, well, it's the biggest public health emergency the world has ever known. By 2050, we expect 10 million deaths worldwide per year. That's the World Health Organization prediction. I think that's a bit of a doomsday scenario. That would put superbugs above heart disease and cancer. Um, but if we don't do something to address this issue, uh, we may see it play out where this becomes the public health issue of our time. Uh, so the doomsday scenario would be 10 million deaths worldwide every single year. I'm optimistic that it won't be that high, but it's going to take a lot of effort to keep us from that number. Are people living in the United States at greater risk of getting a superbug if they travel internationally? The truth about superbugs is that the more you look, the more you find. Uh, I work in New York City, which is an epicenter for superbugs. Part of that is because we have a lot of people living in close quarters. But another part of that is that we're aggressively looking for superbugs. We're trying to categorize how many superbugs there are, let's say, in sub-Saharan Africa. But we don't really know because we haven't been looking as aggressively as we look in other places. So I wouldn't say that it's any more dangerous for me to travel to Nigeria or for a Nigerian to travel to New York City. Um, it's really about the more you look, the more you find. In Chapter 8 of Superbugs, what did you mean by oversight? Oh, oversight is uh, one of the most important things that we are now seeing when it comes to human experimentation. In my book, I write about how the history of clinical trials has evolved. It used to be that doctors were free to patrol themselves, that doctors could decide what was an ethically appropriate clinical trial and what wasn't. And we discovered through appalling failures that doctors weren't very good at judging what was appropriate and what wasn't. There are the extreme examples of the Nazi doctors experimenting uh, on uh, people during the Holocaust. There's the Tuskegee experiments where government doctors in the United States knowingly withheld treatment uh, for sharecroppers who had syphilis. Those are the egregious examples. But there's also scores of other examples of doctors injecting patients with live viruses, with cancer cells, because they were doing it in the name of science. And this is simply wasn't the way it should be done. It was unacceptable. And in the early 1970s, a whistleblower came forward and said, this is, this is wrong. And it led to far more oversight and something called the IRB, the Institutional Review Board, which monitors doctors like me. Uh, every hospital has one that does clinical research. So that let's say I discover some new treatment and I want to bring it to my patients. Let's say I'm watching on TV and somebody is selling zinc oxide to cure superbugs. That may cure superbugs. It may not. And I have to put forth a proposal to this institutional review board that will determine whether or not I can conduct my study. I ended up writing a book about this process, the fact that there was a new antibiotic that had pr been approved by the FDA. And my hospital wasn't using it. And I wanted to use it. And it took almost a year of back and forth with the IRB at my institution. And Frankly, it drove me nuts, but I come to realize that the IRB is really important. They're protecting patients who may not understand the nuances of a clinical trial, and the approval of an IRB means something, that there were patients who were scared and, and sick and anxious, and I was asking them if they wanted to try a new drug, and they don't know if it's safe or not, but the stamp of approval from the IRB was a really powerful thing, uh, and so while they had been my nemesis in the the pre-trial buildup, they actually uh, provided me with something very valuable, and that was um, reassurance for patients that the trial that I was running was ethically uh, appropriate. How did you become a superbug hunter? I don't think any kid wakes up wanting to be a superbug hunter. Maybe they do. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I grew up uh, playing baseball. That was my dream. Uh, and I went to Yale to play baseball, and I thought I was going to be a pro. And it turned out that while I was a pretty good baseball player, um, I had another talent, which was science. And on my baseball team was a guy named John Stites. And his parents were both researchers. And I started working in his dad's lab, a guy named Tom Stites, who ended up winning a Nobel Prize 
And when I was a teenager, I was working in his lab that was working to design new antibiotics. And so at a very young age, uh, even though I dreamed of being a pro baseball player, I was getting exposed to these uh, interesting scientific ideas of how do you build a new antibiotic. And that was something that's carried me the rest of my career. Uh, after my playing days ended, um, I, I returned to the laboratory and I started thinking about ways to improve the treatments of patients with infections. And I now work very closely with people who develop new antibiotics. And what I will do is if someone discovers something promising, I will decide whether or not we should experiment on humans with it. It's a very powerful position to be in. It's one that I don't take lightly. Um, but the idea of being somebody who spends his days experimenting on humans is what I do. And I never dreamed of it. Um, it's incredibly rewarding. It's also very nerve-wracking. Many nights that I go to bed wondering um, if what I've just given a patient was the right thing. And you know, the, the beauty of science is that you show up every day not knowing how things are going to play out. But that can also become a high wire act where patients' lives are in the balance. In chapter 20 of Superbugs, what did you mean by Trojan horses? The Trojan horse approach is something that we're now using to treat patients with superbugs. And it's a brilliant idea. It's been around for a while, but it's recently come, become in vogue again. The idea is that superbugs are evading many of our best antibiotics. So we have to come up with a new way to get those drugs inside of bacteria. And so there's this Trojan horse approach. I'll lay it out very simply, which is that we know bacteria love to eat certain nutrients. One of the things that they love to chew up is iron. They will see iron and swallow it very quickly. So what we're doing is we're attaching antibiotics to iron. And this is the Trojan horse approach, which is that the bacteria, the dangerous bacteria, will see iron and gulp it up. But in the process, they swallow the antibiotic as well. And it's a way of destroying the bacteria uh, without having to let them become resistant to it. And you will be seeing more of this in the future, where we're trying to attach antibiotics to essential nutrients that the bacteria like to eat. It's a tricky thing because you don't want to have it uh, become too toxic of a level where it hurts the humans. So what we look at is something called this therapeutic window which is what is the dose of a drug we can give somebody that's safe for the human but deadly for the bacterium. Are there any government agencies protecting us from superbugs? Oh yes. Uh, there are many agencies that are at work on this. Uh, the first is the National Institute of Health. Uh, the NIH is responsible for coming up with what are the scientific priorities of the country. Uh, and one of the top priorities is developing new antibiotics. What people may not appreciate is how this process unfolds. The government is very good at investing in top scientific talent to discover new antibiotics. But then, once an antibiotic is discovered, the pharmaceutical companies come in because it's so risky to study that new antibiotic that someone's got to take the financial risk. If it's going to cost a billion dollars to do testing to see if that new drug is really as promising as we think, well, the federal government doesn't want to take that on. And so what you see is big pharma coming in and saying, we'll roll the dice. And that's a, a private-public partnership that we've relied upon for the past two generations. But what we're seeing is that this partnership is dissolving, that increasingly the pharmaceutical industry is saying, we don't know that we want to make this investment anymore. And so there are talks about enticing the pharmaceutical industry to do more. And these are called push and pull incentives. A push incentive is to go to a pharmaceutical company and say, hey, your corporate tax rate is 18%. What if we cut it to 15% provided you invest the excess profits or at least a portion of the profits in new antibiotics? It's a provocative idea, uh, but it also means tax cuts for um, big pharma. Some people may not be interested in that. Uh, then there are things called pull incentives, which is to say to a company, if you invest a billion dollars and 10 years of effort to get a drug approved by the FDA, well, rather than giving you five to seven years of market exclusivity, what if we gave you 25 years? What if we allowed you to charge a higher rate for your drug for a longer period of time? These would entice companies to do more. It may also drive up the cost of drugs. 
Then there is an approach, which is to say, if the pharmaceutical industry doesn't want to make new antibiotics, well, good riddance. Uh, maybe the federal government should take over all of this. And you're going to be seeing more and more discussion about what role the pharmaceutical industry should play and what role the federal government should play in developing drugs for these superbugs. And that's going to be one of the great public health discussions we have in 2020 and beyond. Should we throw out bottles of antibiotics that we don't finish? This is a great debate in infectious disease circles, which is how long should you take antibiotics? When I was a medical student, we typically treated pneumonia for seven or eight days. When I was a resident, and a newly minted doctor, it was five days. Now there's talk of shortening it to three days. We're trying to use fewer and fewer doses of antibiotics to treat the same conditions. But now there's an emerging body of literature that's saying, you don't need to take antibiotics for a prescribed period of time. You should just take them until you feel better. I see both sides of the argument with this. Uh, on the one hand, you don't want people taking antibiotics longer than you need to. On the other hand, I don't like the idea of putting the onus on the patient, where the patient has to decide how many days to take. Uh, I think that that erodes the patient-doctor um, relationship, and it also can put some pressure on patients who are unwell, who may not fully understand what condition they have, who are looking at the bottle every morning saying, do I take another pill or do I not? I think that may sow some confusion. And so what I really like is the idea for a patient and a doctor to come up with a plan together, rather than saying, patients should just do whatever they want and when they feel better, throw away the bottle. When was the last antibiotic that was invented? Well, antibiotics are discovered all the time. Um, antibiotics are also created. We can make them through synthetic organic chemistry, where we basically do experiments in a laboratory. Uh, or we can go hunting for them. And the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, approves new drugs, new antibiotics all the time. Um, and we have this pipeline of drugs that are going to be approved this year and in the years ahead. Um, and what we see is that there are lots of drugs that are in development. Um, how many will be approved this year is impossible to say. Um, and the other part that people don't realize is that when an antibiotic is approved, it's not a blanket approval of you can use drug X for anything. It's for very specific indications. So you can use that drug for urinary tract infections or pneumonia or bloodstream infections. And often that approval can send stock prices plummeting if it's approved for something that the company wasn't banking on. And this is a classic example for a company called Achaeogen. They developed a new antibiotic for superbugs called Plazomycin. And they bet heavily that it would be approved for bloodstream infections, but instead it was approved for urinary tract infections. And we didn't really need another new drug for urinary tract infections. And nine months after the drug was approved, the company filed for bankruptcy. And a lot of companies are now looking at Achaeogen and saying, we don't want to end up like them. And that's causing a lot of skittishness among the research and development teams at a number of pharmaceutical companies. In chapter two of Superbugs, what did you mean by a golden era? Well, the golden era of antibiotics was uh, the 1950s, when we were pumping out new drugs seemingly every few months, and life expectancy blossomed. Humans were living longer because infections weren't killing them. And that golden era also predated our appreciation of the dangers of antibiotics. So nobody really knew that something like chloramphenicol could cause gray baby syndrome, or that antibiotics could destroy your kidneys or your brain, uh, or that they could lead to superbugs. And so I called it the golden era because it was this time of brimming enthusiasm. Its possibilities seemed limitless, and it really did help humanity, but we also didn't appreciate the potential downside of antibiotics. In chapter 23 of Superbugs, what did you mean by breakthrough? One of the big breakthroughs in drug development is figuring out where we can hunt for new antibiotics. And it turns out that one of the best places to look is in the soil beneath our feet. That beneath our feet, there are all kinds of life forms, fungi, parasites, bacteria, viruses, that are engaged in a subterranean warfare. 
And what I mean by that is that they are all secreting chemicals into the environment to kill what's around them. It's a subterranean survival of the fittest. And what we're now figuring out is that if we start hunting into that soil and if we could pluck out one of those chemicals, well, we may have an antibiotic. It's something that was designed naturally and specifically to kill different pathogens in the environment. The challenge is figuring out where to look and how do we develop them? How do we decide which one is worth investing in? Um, if you were to just take a scoop of soil from your local playground, there may be five or six different drugs in that soil, but we can't test all of them. They're all a billion dollars worth of testing. Uh, so what we're trying to figure out is where do we put our efforts, where do we put our resources, and how do we match up what we can find with the needs of the patients. Can you sum up everything we've talked about in 15 seconds? The biggest misconception about superbugs is that we are running out of treatments. And the truth is that we are coming up with new treatments all the time. But the challenge is going to be identifying what's the next deadly pathogen. Right now, there's a lot of talk about a virus, a novel coronavirus that has just emerged from the Wuhan pr province in China and uh, what we can do about it. And we're seeing all kinds of uh, aggressive measures, quarantining millions of people, um, coming up with new diagnostic tests. People ask me all the time whether or not we need to come up with a vaccine for it or new treatments for it. And this is what makes the study of superbugs so exciting, that it's always something new. Um, but we need to also be realistic about what pathogens we have in the environment. The fact that influenza will likely kill far more people than this coronavirus that's getting a lot of attention. And whether or not vaccines could be saving more lives than all of the resources combined that we put towards uh, quarantining people for the Wuhan virus. So uh, the thing about superbugs is that it's not going away. It's fascinating. And you've got a lot of people who wake up every day trying to figure out how do you protect the most vulnerable patients. What's the one thing I need to do today? The most important thing that you can do to protect yourself are things that people don't usually like doing. Things like getting a good night's sleep, not drinking too much, trying to eat a balanced diet. Uh, the people I see who run into trouble either have a defect in their immune system or they're running themselves ragged. They're worn down and they're becoming vulnerable to the things that are in our environment. So it's not a, an exciting answer to say try to get a good night's sleep and not drink too much and eat a balanced diet. But those are the first steps that you can take towards just putting yourself in a position to succeed. Why was it important for you to come here and speak at the real truth about health conference? You know, one of the things I really enjoy is reaching new audiences. And a lot of the lectures that I give are actually to academics to doctors who are general practitioners, who may know a little bit about superbugs, but not a lot. And I like educating doctors, but I've also found that I really like educating patients. I spend a lot of time at the bedside um, with my white coat on talking to patients about where their drug-resistant bacterium came from. And I've found increasingly that while I enjoy talking to patients, I also enjoy talking to the average person on the street who just wants to know more, who may be um, nervous about this and I can provide some reassurance uh, or the person who may not realize that they're at risk. And so I come from a family of educators and the thing that I really enjoy doing is educating the public about a topic that I care so deeply about. If people want to learn more about your work, uh, how can they do that? Well, the easiest thing is to go to my website, which is www.drmattmccarthy.com. I'm also on Twitter, Dr. Matt McCarthy. Um, and then if you Google me, you can find lots of uh, pieces that I've written, not just for academic presses, but um, my books, uh, my journalism. I've written for the, the Slate, Sports Illustrated, the New York Times. I'm a nonfiction book reviewer for USA Today. Uh, I write all kinds of stuff, uh, and I would be um, uh, eager to share any and all of that with people who are at this conference.